again. We talked last time about the types of business decisions we have to make and how we go about formulating the questions that will inform those decisions. Now we need to get our heads around the different types of data that we can use to answer those questions. I mentioned earlier that data can be made up of numbers, measurements, observation, words or descriptions of things. That's okay as a starter, but to help us decide what sort of data we might need, we have to get a feel for the different types of data that are available. The first main way to differentiate data is to decide whether it is what we call quantitative or qualitative data. The names give it away really. Let's start by considering quantitative data. Quantitative data are all about quantities, measurements and numbers. The numbers of apples in a box, the weight of apples in the box, the sugar content of my grapes, number of fish in a pen, number of people shopping online, the amount people spend online, the temperature of milk in the vat. Now we can further differentiate these by looking at whether we're talking about things that can only be measured as discrete chunks, e.g. numbers of apples in a box, or along a continuous range, like the weight of apples in the box. In this case, the number of apples in a box, the number of fish in a pen, the number of people shopping online are all examples of discrete data. They can only be, in this case, whole numbers. On the other hand, the weight of apples in the box, the sugar content of my grapes, the amount people spend online, and the temperature of milk in the vat are all examples of continuous data because they all fall along a continuous range of values. This differentiation can be important as it can affect the way we analyse the data and the type of information we can infer from the data. Now qualitative data, on the other hand, consider the quality of the thing being measured and are somewhat harder to analyse. A few examples of qualitative data include how people feel about a product or service, the colour of an apple, the taste of yoghurt, the smell of cooking chips. Now you probably have noticed that there are grey areas in all of these differentiations. The colour of an apple, for example, could be quantified, but doing so needs highly technical equipment and may not be relevant to the question at hand. So again, decisions about the type of data to be collected must be grounded in the questions you want answered. The final main way of splitting data is to decide whether your question relates to a snapshot study giving you information from a single point in time, or if you want longitudinal data, giving you information of trends over time. Snapshot data will be useful for, say, market testing of a new product, or for understanding the importance of inoculation temperature in yogurt making. You'd probably choose to gather longitudinal data to understand and therefore predict, for example, milk fat content over the season, or grape sugar content during the summer. Okay, so we started teasing out the different types of data. We've got qualitative, descriptive data, which is harder to quantify and analyse. We've got quantitative data, which in turn can be grouped as discrete or continuous, and which can be collected as part of snapshot or longitudinal data sets. Data of all sorts can be collected in many ways. It can be generated as part of small in-house trials, and it can be amassed and collated as part of huge ongoing operation. Which brings us to another topic that's worth touching on, big data. It's a buzzword that's raising its head more and more these days. Big data is nothing more than big data sets, huge data sets really, that are only made useful by our recent ability to throw massive amounts of computing power at them, to tease out trends and relationship that us mere mortals couldn't find in a useful time frame. Some big retail chains, for example, make real-time, hour-by-hour, even minute-by-minute minute adjustments to pricing based on real-time data and their understanding of shopping trends and patterns. Now, once the domain of government, research or private institutions, big databases are becoming more easily accessible by everyone. A prime public example is local, national and global weather and climate data. This data is available and can be used, for example, to look at patterns and trends in climate and how these may be influencing your current production cycles or how they may inform decisions on future production and enterprises. On a local front, a private big data company is using real-time environmental data 
to help Tasmanian oyster farmers predict if their harvest period may be closed due to approaching inclement weather. In this case, the combination of remote data collection, computing power, and an increasing understanding of the relationship between environmental conditions and the food safety status of fresh oysters is helping growers decide when to get stock out of the water before they might be closed. You can imagine how this helps cash flow and continuity of supply. I reckon that'll do us for now. So as you think about the decisions you need to make in your business, give some deeper thought to the types of data that will help you make these decisions. I'll see you soon with a bit of a synthesis of what we've discussed to date.